Greetings everyone. Uh, today's uh, talk uh, discussion is on the fundamental concepts involved in normal wound healing. We understand how wounds normally heal, then perhaps in uh, the subsequent talks we'll try to understand why some wounds don't heal. So first, what's an ulcer? Let's define an ulcer. An ulcer is a localized defect in the epithelium. So your skin has an outer layer of epidermis. If the epidermis is violated, you develop an ulcer. Now, the underlying dermis and uh, the fat or the muscle tissues may also be involved, but that is not a prerequisite for formation of an ulcer. Similarly, the lining of your mouth, the outermost layer is the mucosa, the mucosa. If the mucosa is uh, violated or there's a localized destruction in the mucosa, one develops a mouth ulcer. There are two fundamental types of healing. There's healing by primary intention, a type of healing that occurs after a surgical incision uh, is closed by a surgeon. So you have a surgical incision that is closely approximated by sutures. And since the defect is minimal, you get epithelialization within about 48 hours. So essentially, the incision now has a barrier which is made of epithelial cells. And that's why some surgeons will allow patients to take a shower after 48 hours. Now, there's a healing by secondary intention. In the healing by secondary intention, as you can see from the figures here, there is a defect in the tissues. And that defect uh, has now got to be repaired through some form of regeneration or some form of healing where that defect has got to be filled with some matrix uh, when the wound is left open. And this matrix that fills this defect is called granulation tissue, which we'll talk about in uh, uh, a minute. Healing by secondary intention results in far more scarring than healing by primary intention because in primary intention the wound edges are closely approximated. Now traditionally uh, the wound healing has been classified into four phases hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation and remodeling. Some people uh, omit the phase of hemostasis and call it three phases inflammation, proliferation and remodeling. In any case, we'll discuss all the four phases. The analogy I like to use uh, from everyday life for wound healing is, let's say one has a local disaster, let's, for example, uh, a hurricane that leads to local uh, destruction of a habitat or a, a small town. How does one rebuild after a hurricane? You know, there's local flooding, property destruction. Well, firstly, you're going to send in the plumbers to control the flooding. Once the flooding is controlled, then you'll send in the cleaners to uh, take care of the debris, clean the area. Once the area is cleaned, one will send in the builders to build new houses. And finally, when the new houses and properties are rebuilt, one sends in the decorators to decorate. And that's essentially how wounds heal. Because your phase of hemostasis is when there's bleeding, those are your plumbers. The body acts in such a way to control and then stop the bleeding. Phase of inflammation is when the body is cleaning out the debris, your cleaners. Phase of proliferation is when the body is making new cells, uh, filling in that defect, your builders. And then finally, finally remodeling is... Uh, um, similar to uh, the decorators, uh, so to speak. So, if one looks at this uh, diagram uh, on uh, right, my right, as I'm looking at the screen, you have a phase of inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. The take-home message is, is that these phases overlap. These are orderly phases, but there is a significant amount of overlap. And there are a number of cells involved, which tend to be distinct for each phase, and we'll discuss that in a second. 
Now let's explore the phase of hemostasis. You have an injured blood vessel uh, that is severed and the blood is leaking. The injured blood vessel undergoes spasm or what we call vasoconstriction, reducing the caliber or the diameter of the blood vessel leading to reduced blood loss. In addition, uh, the platelets are activated. The local tissues uh, that have been damaged uh, by uh, trauma release factors which activate platelets. The platelets form a plug to plug the injured blood vessel defect. Now if that wasn't enough, there are two other pathways called the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathways. The effect of both of these pathways is to generate fibrin, which is formed from fibrinogen. Fibrin forms a mesh, and this mesh plugs uh, the defect in uh, the injured uh, blood vessel. So you have vasospasm, you have platelet plug, and the fibrin plug, and they all interact to control bleeding. Now, very briefly, the intrinsic pathway uh, is activated when the endothelial cells of the blood vessel are damaged, leading to exposure of the subendothelial collagen. And this collagen is procoagulant, and it activates factor 12, which then activates factor 11, and then this further activates factor 9 so on until it eventually leads to activation of uh, fibrinogen to fibr and sorry until it eventually leads to conversion of fibrinogen uh, to fibrin. It's called a coagulation cascade because um, factor 12 leads to activation of more factor 11 and there's more factor 9 than factor 11 so the effect is amplified as one goes down the chain. The extrinsic pathways lead to activation of factor 7 which then eventually leads to activation of prothrombin to thrombin and then conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. So both of these pathways interact with each other to uh, enhance the formation of fibrin which forms a clot. Now, uh, one may think, well, if this is left uncontrolled, the clot can propagate locally. So, in addition to um, plugging the defect, it can then propagate and could theoretically lead to blockage of the blood vessel. But there are feedback pathways. So, your thrombin uh, here in the coagulation pathway activates antithrombin 3 and also plasminogen which break down uh, fibrin. The whole effect of this is to limit the clot to the site of the defect so it doesn't propagate away from the defect and could potentially lead to unintended consequences uh, including uh, total blockage of uh, the blood vessel and local tissue ischemia which is a topic of discussion for another time. So here is a high-powered view of a blood clot. Uh, one can see fibrin strands, um, and these fibrin strands uh, form a mesh uh, which traps red blood cells, and in addition to those trapped red blood cells, one also sees uh, um, platelets which form uh, the local plug. So fibrin and platelets form a plug which stops bleeding from the injured blood vessels. So after the transient uh, hem uh, hemostasis phase, the phase of hemostasis, uh, there's the inflammatory phase which can last up to five days. The purpose of the inflammatory phase is to clean out uh, non-viable tissues, debris, and bacteria. Initially, uh, after vasoconstriction, one may see uh, local vasodilatation. Vasodilatation is uh, increase in blood flow to the injured site. Uh, 
and uh, if one looks at uh, acutely healing wound that's why uh, there's an area of erythema redness the purpose of vasodilatation is to increase uh, the delivery of nutrients and uh, cells that will be involved in wound healing. The initial cell is the neutrophil. The neutrophil uh, is the initial cell to arrive at the site of injury. It involves bacteria and uh, non-viable tissues. The engulfed bacteria are killed within the cell by uh, enzymes called hydrolases and also by uh, locally produced hydrogen peroxide and hypochlorous acid within vacuoles, as we will see in a minute. The next cell to arrive is the macrophage. Uh, again, there's an overlap uh, in uh, these cells. It's not as if one dies, then the other one comes. There's a substantial overlap. The macrophage has a similar picture as uh, has a similar function as the neutrophil but unlike the neutrophil the macrophage also releases multitude of local inflammatory mediators that helps to control wound healing so inflammatory mediators from uh, VEGF to transforming growth factors to a whole host of other inflammatory mediators. So the macrophage, in addition to engulfing bacteria and non-viable tissue, is the central cell involved in coordinating wound healing. And it starts off in the inflammatory phase. And as you can see in this picture, there's the fibrin clot, the neutrophil, which it's sitting here silently, the macrophage, releasing a whole, host, a whole host of inflammatory mediators. Um, so that is the inflammatory phase of wound healing. Now, how do the macrophages and the neutrophils clean out uh, debris? Uh, very briefly, here you can see the two cell types under the microscope. The neutrophils have trilobed nucleus. Uh, so that's how they are distinguished. The macrophages have a central dense area with a surrounding uh, hypodense area. So that's why they have traditionally uh, uh, been described as fried egg appearance, uh, which you can see uh, in this uh, uh, microscopic picture. So when these cells encounter bacteria, they form a pseudopodium around the bacteria uh, similar to how the amoeba engulfs uh, debris. Uh, these engulfed uh, bacterium uh, form a vacuole uh, within the cell and then there's a, a, an organelle within the cell called the lysosome. The lysosome releases its enzymes into this vacuole and these enzymes called hydrolases can then digest the bacteria and other macromolecules. In addition, as we uh, uh, noted uh, in the previous slide, you have a local generation of hydrogen peroxide and hypochlorous acid, which also help and aids killing of bacteria. The digestive products from uh, local micro digestion of bacteria and non viable tissue are then released by the cells into the extracellular uh, space. So as we noted, the macrophage is the central cell in wound healing, at least in the inflammatory phase, because it helps coordinate wound healing. Microphages release multiple growth factors and inflammatory mediators. Uh, this sh table here shows the different types of uh, growth factors involved in wound healing from epidermal growth factors to transforming growth factors to platelet derived growth factors which as you guessed is released by the platelets but PDGF or the platelet derived growth factor is not only released by platelets but a whole host of other cells so the two things to note here is not only there are multiple growth factors but there is not 
one single cell type that only releases a growth factors a growth factor the same growth factor can be released by multiple cells and there are multiple growth factors released in the healing wound um, the cells involved in releasing uh, these growth factors range from platelets macrophages endothelial cells smooth muscle cells keratinocytes so on so the proliferative phase of wound healing uh, usually commences or can commence as early as day two and can last up to three weeks in a normally healing wound. It's important to know that during the proliferative phase of wound healing, this defect in the tissues is not replaced by regenerated native tissue. So let me give you an example. So if you have a, a defect in the skin, so the epidermis, the dermis, and the underlying uh, subcutaneous tissue, the fat, uh, may have been uh, uh, violated and destroyed. But the healing wound does not regenerate fat. It does not regenerate the dermis. The healing wound fills this defect with what we call granulation tissue. And uh, in the subsequent slide, we'll discuss the components of the granulation tissue. So in the proliferative phase, you get what we call angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is formation of new blood vessels. So what happens is the capillaries that are at the edges of the wound, they sprout uh, new uh, uh, blood vessels, which then um, uh, migrate into uh, the healing wound, uh, helping to increase the vascularity and deliver uh, nutrients and also migrating uh, cells. The migrating cell type predominant in uh, the proliferative phase or is the fibroblast. The fibroblast migrate into the wound and uh, uh, form the extracellular matrix, which we'll discuss in a minute. The predominant type of ECM, although the extracellular matrix, is collagen. And this increase uh, uh, a proliferation of fibroblast is called fibroplasia. So as you can see in this diagram here, so you have this extracellular matrix and fibroblasts. Uh, these are the two predominant components that fill in the gap of the healing wound, not your native tissue. And once uh, this gap has been filled, then you get migration of keratinocytes from the wound edges to uh, close the wound. Uh, so your fibroblast and your collagen is basically the house built and your keratinocyte, keratinocytes are the roof placed on top of the house. And then uh, now let's look into the components of the proliferative phase. So the components of the proliferative phase are the extracellular matrix and the cells. Together, the ECM and the cells form what we call the granulation tissue. And this is the very red tissue that you see in healing wounds, as depicted by the three pictures here. The extracellular matrix uh, consists of collagen, elastin, and other extracellular uh, macromolecules called proteoglycans, which you can read about uh, on the internet. The cell components of the ECM are the fibroblasts, which make the extracellular matrix, the endothelial cells, which form the capillaries, and the myofibroblasts, which are involved in wound contraction. So your proliferative phase uh, is a phase that results in formation of granulation tissue that has two components, cellular components, and the extracellular matrix, uh, which is predominantly collagen and other extracellular components, as noted here, glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans. So once the defect in the proliferative phase uh, is uh, completely filled in with this granulation tissue, the next thing that happens is you get migration of cells from the wound edges to completely close the wound. So here you see these migrating cells migrating from the edges 
to close the wound. Here, and this, this is called epithelialization. So again, this red area is an open wound, and this pale area is migrating cells, which are now closing the wound. So that's the last part of the proliferative phase. You got migration of epithelial cells from the wound edges to close the wound. So now once you have a wound that's completely healed, it contracts. And that's a good thing because your wounds can contract up to 80%. So the original size of the wound can be reduced by up to 80%. And that's good because as we have noted, the healed wound is basically not your native tissue. It's collagen with uh, other extracellular matrix components. It's not your native dermis or your fat or your muscle. So wound contraction helps to bring the normal tissue to replace the healed tissue. And that is done by cells in the wound called myofibroblasts. Myofibroblasts have these contractile actin filaments and build like the muscle, they contract and pull the wound edges closer and closer together and your wounds can contract up to like three quarters of a millimeter a day. The final result, which can take months, uh, the wound may be 20% uh, of its original size. So here you see uh, one depiction and notice that the wound contracts asymmetrically. So this wound probably extended all the way down to here, but contraction is pulling normal tissue to fill in the healed area, which is good because the normal tissue, as we will see, has better uh, mechanical characteristics than the healed tissue. And here you see a large wound, and look, this is a newly healed wound, and by the time it's healed, already is much smaller, and over the coming months, the size of this wound will get smaller and smaller as wound contraction pulls in the surrounding tissue, the normal tissue, to fill in the gap. And if one thinks about it, that's a good thing, because your normal tissue is the better tissue, not the scar tissue, right? So, so as we already discussed, the last phase of wound healing is remodeling. And one component of remodeling is wound contraction, as we already discussed. Now, remodeling can start as early as three weeks and last up to two years. If there's wound contraction across a joint, uh, make sure patients are referred to physiotherapy and taught range of motion exercises, otherwise one can get a joint contracture. During wound contraction, uh, there's remodeling of collagen fibers. Type 3 collagen is replaced by type 1. There's increased in collagen cross-linking. Um, and the scar becomes less conspicuous. So if you look at the picture here, Initially, this newly formed scar is a little red and angry and with increased dimensions. After a few months, it becomes less conspicuous. Uh, during the phase of remodeling, the wounds become stronger. So at the end of two months, uh, the healed area has about 60% of the native tissue strength. At the end of two years, it's about 80%. So your healed area, the scarred area, is never as good as the native tissue. And that's why after surgery, the surgeons will ask you to wait for about two months, i.e. after a hernia surgery, before you do any type of significant lifting. The other thing to note is that the scar, uh, this regenerated tissue, the scar tissue, does not have any sweat glands. Now remember, your sweat glands produce water-based and oil-based products. So uh, patients have got to be instructed to apply moisturizer to the healed areas. Otherwise, the scar tissue become brittle, can crack off, and then you can potentially get recurrence of the wound. Of course, the other thing to note is that if your uh, scar tissue is placed in an area of excess moisture, i.e. Uh, you know, patients with sacral wounds, if they are incontinent, this excess moisture can also be harmful. So you have to apply occlusive products to protect uh, the scar tissue from overhydration. Normally that is done by the sweat glands through 
production of oily substances. So in summary, initially you have injury and injury results in coagulation, i.e. control of bleeding. And then you have the inflammatory phase. The purpose of the inflammatory phase is to clean out the debris, the bacteria, and the non-viable tissue. So, and this uh, basically uh, allows the formation of a clean wound bed upon which uh, new tissue, granulation tissue can be deposited by the migrating fibroblasts and increase in vascularization through uh, capillary sprouting, what we call granulation tissue. Once this granulation tissue fills in the defect, then you get cells from the wound edges called keratinocytes migrating to uh, completely close the wound. And over a period of months to up to two years, this newly healed wound undergoes reorganization where it becomes stronger and more robust uh, over a period of time and the scar tissue becomes less conspicuous. So that's uh, normal wound healing. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. If you did, uh, don't forget to press the like button and uh, uh, follow this channel uh, and you'll be notified uh, when uh, we add a more educational uh, material. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention and have a great day.